because that's how you run them. But again, most people eat too many. They eat them alone, they eat the wrong types. So when you do have carbs, and, and our program, we'll go over it later in the seminar, that when you eat carbs, you have to combine what carbs you do eat, you have to combine them with proteins and fats. Because proteins and fats act as a buffer for the carbohydrates. What happens when you eat a protein with your carbohydrates, your proteins are broken down into NH3 and amino acids. So what happens, you know, you eat protein with your carbs, you have amino acids, metabolites from protein metabolism, and NH3 going through your system. And then usually most proteins have some fat in it, and then you include some good healthy fats. You have your byproducts and fat metabolism, your free fatty acids, and your triglycerides. Now, your insulin receptors here are eating, and they're going, the percentage of sugar, or percentage of glucose is not high. So I'm not going to release insulin or over-release it. So your fats, your proteins act as a buffer to make sure that this whole thing does not happen here. I think all diabetics, or borderline diabetics, should be taught that, and they're not. Very, very important. And if you want to make sure you're burning fat properly and not adding fat, you sure, you sure want to make sure that you combine your proteins and your fats and your carbs together. If you think eating low-fat foods is the answer, it's not. Because anytime you pull fat out of food, what happens? You increase the percentage of the other two macronutrients. So percentage of protein increases and your percentage of carbohydrate increases also. So as you pull fat out of food, you pull fat out of yogurt, the percentage of sugar jumps up. You pull fat out of any food, the percentage of carbohydrate jumps up and you're more prone to this. So low-fat is not the answer, it never has been. A lot of re recent research also shows that there, um, when it comes to cholesterol, that there's two types of cholesterol, I'm sure you all know, HDL, high-density lipoproteins, yeah. the, good the good cholesterol, mm -hmm. and the LDL, yeah. low-density lipoproteins, bad cholesterol. But research shows now there's two types of LDL, two types of bad cholesterol. One type will increase and add plaque to your arteries, and that corresponds to increase in carbohydrates. Isn't that shocking? The other LDL will increase and does not cause plaque buildup, and that's when you have an increase of fats in your diet. Cholesterol, carbs and cholesterol. We have documented research of our clients increase the amount of red meat and eggs in their diet, going through our six week challenge or 21 graph of fat loss, having cholesterol tests done before and after, every time cholesterol goes down. Their fats, their red meats increase in their diet, the carbs go down, cholesterol goes down. Sometimes by 100 points. And then blood pressure, if you're worried about your blood pressure, your blood pressure will skyrocket more when you increase your carbohydrate consumption because of the water retention. A gram, two grams of water, one gram of carbohydrates. So you eat a lot of carbs, you're gonna have blood pressure issues. Increase the water volume in, in, your, in your arteries and in your vessels. Much quicker than they have, add a little salt to your foods. So for me, this is you need to control this for health, and you need to control that for weight loss and fat loss. That's the whole carbohydrate thing, and that's the key. Any questions about carbs? Mm -hmm. Yes. So red meats are actually a good thing, then. Well, because <clears throat> I know you said like for my blood type, you said that I should stay yeah, away so from it. A lot. Of, there's a lot of misconceptions out there that you can't eat too many eggs because you have high cholesterol. I don't believe in that, because I can show you people who have been through what we have and the cholesterol level has actually gone down. Red meat, I'm going to talk about red meat, organic red meat that doesn't have hormones and, and antibiotics or residues in them, is a very healthy way of getting proteins and fat is in your system. How can you ensure that it's organic? I mean, well, can you, you really trust labels? You buy it and it says organic and you have a higher chance that it will be than if there's no label on it. Grass <laughs> fed. Nobody's 100%, but yeah, that's what you, you hope you deal with reputable companies. Um, but there's some blood types that do very well. Like if you're an O blood type, this is additional for you. You actually gain health and lose weight. If you're an O blood type, most O's. But if you're an A blood type, red meat does the opposite for you. So biochemically, it's very healthy for one blood type, but not for another. And there's no two people in this whole room who are going to eat exactly the same. Blood type variations, uh, genetic backgrounds, things like that. So I like to use blood tape, typing to layer over the nutrition work we do because that, it helps and it has helped. So yes, red meat is good for O's and B's, 
A's and AB's don't do so well with it. Okay. So good question. Okay. The third thing I'm going to cover is the number four on your chart. I'm going to cover that further and I'll come back to three. But number four is do not eat gluten or wheat. So if you guys are driving around you see gluten-free pizza, you see gluten-free Chinese food, you see gluten-free everything. It's not a fad. It's, you're going to see it more and more. And basically what happens people realizing that gluten makes them sick and does not make them well. Um, Gluten, what gluten is, gluten is a protein that's found in wheat. Now wheat, wheat products and breads don't have a lot of protein in them to begin with. It's a very small amount, but that little bit of protein that's in wheat, that gluten molecule, what it does, it inflames the human digestive tract. I think it's 60% of all Americans are gluten tolerant and don't know it. And I think you'll see that number will go up as, as time goes on. But basically what it does is it inflames your small intestines. So I'm just going to draw a, a real quick chart. This is the inside of your small intestine where most digestive absorption of minerals and vitamins and amino acids happen. So when you eat foods, they're broken down and they come through your system here. And then all along um, these finger-like projections we call villa, there's small hair-like projections called microvilla. And what happens is your body absorbs calcium, magnesium, vitamins, amino acids through here, comes up through here, comes up and it goes right through your blood system. When you eat gluten, what gluten does, it inflames these villi and makes them real big and red and sore. In advanced stages, like celiac and some other types of diseases, it actually burns those hair-like projections off. And then your receptor sites are compromised, your body can't take in vitamins, minerals, and proteins, and things like that, and then all of a sudden you have digestive issues. So if you're having trouble with bone density loss, your body can't absorb calcium because your receptor sites <coughs> are most likely compromised. So you can take all the calcium supplements you want and eat all calcium-rich foods you want. It's never going to get in until you clear out the inflammation here. So these things get all big and red and sore, and then you can't digest foods, you can't get vitamins and minerals, you have no energy, and a lot of other things happen. Um, uh, the most advanced case of this, I'm sure you've all seen it before, is a classic beer belly. Boom. So I have people come in and, like all you guys can go through the body fat test on Thursday, you're going to come in, I'm going to pinch your skin here and over here and seven different places, and I'll get somebody with a stomach like that, and I'll go and I'll pinch them, and I'm like, I got a lot of fat there, and I'm like, no you don't. There's not a lot of fat there. You pull that skin away, and there's, there's fat, but not a lot. And they'll go, what is that? So that's inside. That's your intestines are so inflamed, it's pushing your belly out. And it keeps distending. And then what happens, it pushed out so far, it causes, it causes a neural shutdown of the abdominal muscle, and it gets real soft and relaxed, and they can't fire it, and just pushes it out. So that's an advanced stage of this. The beer belly. What's beer made from? Wheat. Wheat, Wheat. barley, and it's full of gluten, then you go out and have pizza. <laughs> what's pizza full of? Gluten. Gluten, right? And what's on pizza? Cheese. Cheese. Now, next thing, cheese. Yeah. Cheese has... <laughs> I'm taking all your food away. <laughs> cheese has... Cheese is, a, is a, yeah. a cow dairy product that contains a couple of proteins, but one protein in cow's dairy is called casein. And casein is a, one of the protein molecules that's got a really long chain. It's huge, and humans can't digest it. It takes humans two to four hours to digest the carbohydrate. It takes humans four to six hours to digest the fat and the protein. Research shows that after 14 hours in the human digestive tract, casein doesn't even begin to become digested. So where does it go? Your arteries. It stays inside the intestinal tract. And it putrefies. And it rots. And it seeps out. And it causes a whole host of um, responses in different people usually starting in the skin and working its way out. Asthma, digestive issues, weight gain, all these things. So that's not, this isn't common knowledge. And I'm gonna bring it to you because that's what we study. But what casein does, besides what I just told you, but casein further inflames the villa and the microvilla. It does not cause the inflammation, but it's like putting gasoline on a fire. It makes it worse. So if you're eating wheat and gluten, putting cheese on